So we talked last time about uh, functions that are random variable like this, g of x. And that's going to be some new random variable y. We talked about how do you find the PDF and the CDF of y when that expression was one to one. What if, if it's not one to one? For example, let's suppose that I have um, y equals x squared, right? That means that when x is negative 2 and x is positive 2, both those numbers get mapped to y equals 4, and that, have an, that has an impact on the way that the PDF and the CDF look, right? So let's think about this again. It's always good to draw a picture in these cases. So this is like saying, okay, um, what's the probability that y is less than or equal to some number? Well, it's the probability that x squared is less than or equal to some number. Now I think about, okay, well, what does that mean? That means that... Um, x is between minus square root of y and plus square root of y. Let's draw a picture to think about why that's true, right? So if this is x and this is y and y is x squared, I want to know, okay, what is the probability that y is less than some number is this interval, right? Where does that interval map onto onto x? Well, it maps on to these values of x here, right? So if this number is y, little y, then these numbers are square root of y positive and square root of y negative. And so actually then this, the values that I need here are the CDF of x at square root of y minus the CDF of x at minus square root of y, right? So things get a little bit hairy. And then if I wanted to, I could take the derivative and say, okay, then what would the PDF be? It would be the derivative of the CDF. Um, so let me just do a concrete example with a Gaussian. So let's suppose that x is Gaussian with mean zero and sigma one. This is like our standard normal random variable. And now I want to know y is equal to x squared. What is the PDF of y? Well, I would use the um, picture I just drew, right? Here's my PDF of x. This is 1 over 1 over square root of 2 pi, e to the minus x squared over 2, right? Now, let's go back to this slide for a second. I know that the CDF of y is related to the CDF of x like this, what is the um, PDF of y? I take the derivative of this with respect to y, right? So I've got to have the PDF at square root of y times the derivative of the inside, which is one half like this. And then I have over here, again, the derivative of the PDF here times the derivative on the inside, which is negative one over like this. And so what do I have? I have 1 over square, 2 square root of y times the difference between these PDFs. And now I plug in, I guess now I have a, I inherited a positive from here. So now I plug in, what do I know about the PDF? Well, I'm just going to plug in square root of y in for this. And what I get is um, that the new PDF is 1 over 2 square root of y times the PDF originally evaluated at square root of y plus the PDF evaluated at minus square root of y. So I actually get um, 1 over 2 square root of 2 pi y. I get a factor of 2 e to the minus e to the oh there's a minus sign right sorry e to the minus y over 2. And then this is only true for positive values of y. Right, I kind of refer back to my picture. I know that y being x squared has to be a positive number. So when I'm less than zero, I have zero probability of that happening. So this is the way I would derive this general PDF. And this is actually known as a chi-squared random variable another one that you're likely to see in a table. It has this Greek chi-squared with one degree of freedom. 
Okay. So this is kind of like the more general case. Things can get even more complicated, unfortunately, and we're not going to do too much of this. But let's suppose, for example, that um, you know I had g of x was the absolute value of x, right? What does the PDF of y look like? Again, I would draw the picture and say, okay, here is the relationship between x and y. And again, I'd say, what's the probability that y is less than this value? I'd have to trace it back onto my corresponding interval or event in x. This is like x being between plus y and minus y. So this is like saying the, um, the CDF of y would be the CDF of x at y minus the CDF of x at minus y, and so the derivative, the PDF, would be the PDF at y plus the PDF at minus y, and again only for y positive and zero for y negative. Right. So even worse would be something, sometimes you see in these um, electrical engineering applications things like blankers or limiters or rectifiers. So what if y was what we'd call the positive part of x? This is like saying it's x if x is greater than 0 and it's 0 otherwise. So the plot for this looks like, you know, here is x, here is y. When x is less than 0, I get nothing. When x is positive, I get y. Right? So now I have to think about, okay, well, what is the CDF of y here? Clearly it's going to be 0 if y is less than 0. And when it is, um, when y is greater than 0, what I get is the CDF of x evaluated at y. Right? The problem with this is that it's possible that x may have some negative values, right? So if I think about drawing this picture, what it would mean is that if my old CDF looked like this, it could be that I have some negative values before I accrue my stuff up to 1. And so that means that in the new um, PDF of y, that's like saying that nothing happens up to this point, and suddenly I jump up to this value, and then I go up here. So this would produce what would be like this kind of a weird, like mixed PDF, which I don't like to talk about too much because it gets complicated, right? Because then if I was going to look at the PDF, I'd have to take the derivative of this, and I'd have a part that would be, you know, smooth, and a part that would be like an impulse function. So it would be like ugly. I don't even want to draw it because it makes me headache. So I'd have like a jump up here, a delta function corresponding to the step function, plus whatever the derivative of this part of the, you know, um, CDF was. So I'd have a mix of impulse functions and normal functions, and it would just be a mess. So in general, you're going to get these kinds of like tricky manifestations whenever you have something like, um, you know, like a limiter, in electrical engineering is something like this, where I have a, a limiter that prevents the value of y from getting that big. Or I could have a blanker that says anything outside of this region just gets cut off to zero. If you think about the impact that these things have on random variables, you're going to find that the, um, you know, uh, PDFs are really nasty, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Um, just in general, just to provide one capper on this, what I would say is that, you know, if there are a set of values that map to a given value y, then the PDF is basically related to a weighted sum of the values of these places. This is just like kind of what comes out of the chain rule. So this is a general formula for what you would do if you had like 
x cubed or x to the fifth or something like that. Now these are really generally pretty nasty, so I'm not going to really emphasize this. If you know how to deal with the one-to-one -one case and simple things like x squared or absolute value of x, then I think that you'll be okay for most problems that you're considering.